One, go. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our eighth reading of this, our 21-22 Milwaukee Poetry Series season. I'm Tom Hogan, the uh, coordinator of the Milwaukee Poetry Series, and we want to welcome you and say how glad we are that you're joining us. We know that you have a lot of choices and demands on your time, and we appreciate it very much you spending some time with us and our poet this evening, Gary Lark, who I'm going to introduce in just a few minutes. We are here at the Willamette Falls <coughs> Center. Uh, my wife, Jane, and I, to my left, we have a studio audience this evening. Uh, and we're going to have a question and answer period after Gary's reading. So we'll have some questions from the audience at that point. There is also a live chat feature that you have. And if you have a question and you want to ask it to Gary, put it in the chat. And we will see if we can get all those questions answered when we get to that point in the evening. I want to make some thanks because there are a lot of people who work on this. Thanks to the city of Milwaukee for the support that you've given to us over the years. Thanks secondly to the Letting Library of Milwaukee. We are a committee of the Letting Library and we appreciate the support from the library that we've had. We also have a Milwaukee Poetry Series committee. And as you know, and as I say, you don't have something happen unless you have people working on it. And we have an active poetry committee that works on this and we appreciate that. We appreciate Willamette Falls Media Center as well. And our technician tonight, who is Joshua Reynolds, and he is assisted by one of our Milwaukee Poetry Series committee members, Bev Spurgeon, uh, who is learning how to do all of this. So that's very appreciated. And finally, we appreciate all of you for being with us. I also want to wish you happy National Poetry Month. As you know, April is National Poetry Month, and we want to celebrate poetry. And we are celebrating. One of the ways that we are celebrating here is with the reading that we have tonight. And I've been looking forward to this. So Gary Lark is our, our poet, and he is with us. Gary is a lifelong Oregonian. He grew up in the Umpqua River Valley and was shaped by the river. He said that earlier when we were talking about preparing for the reading. And the river was one of his teachers. His most recent collection is Easter Creek from Main Street Rag 2021. Other work includes Daybreak on the Water, Flowstone Press, Ordinary Gravity, Early Press, River of Solace, In the House of Memory, Without a Map, Getting By. His poetry has appeared in the Beloit Poetry Journal, Catamaran, Poet Lore, Raffle, and The Sun. We are very excited about this tonight and very happy to have Gary here. Would you join me in welcoming our poet for this evening, Gary Lark. Gary. So we'll start with uh, Copeland Creek. Copeland Creek. Long before they were paved, we drove the stutter of washboard roads pounded endlessly by log trucks 30 miles up Adams' bony ribs to a paradise called Copeland Creek. We camped where the creek spills into the North Umpqua. I was eight years old and the river sang. After sleeping in the river's voice, my father, his friend, and I put fly rods together, mine a nine-foot bamboo with mended tip and casting reel full of fly line. We met, we waded pool to pool, side to side, the flash of silver filling our creels. There were pools too deep so the closest man would grab my free hand and pull me half swimming to the next gravel bar. Back at camp, morning light still filtering through fur needles, mother tended Dutch oven biscuits as trout curled in the frying pan. There's a part of me still there, surrounded by enormous trees, the river singing me alive. I'm a third generation fly fisherman. My grandfather, who was um, born in sometime in the 1880s, started um, 
herding sheep in Wyoming when he was a, a young lad, probably 14. And I can imagine him sticking the fly rod in his pack to head up to the, to the mountain to herd the sheep because uh, a fly rod and a few flies didn't weigh anything. And he was able to catch dinner every mm -hmm. now and then that, that was not sheep. My father was a, was a millwright at the uh, lumber mills around Roseburg, and this is a, a poem called After Work. He would come home with the shape of welding goggles impre impressed around his eyes. We, were, we would throw our fly rods in the back of the truck and head up Little River with a foot of daylight hanging in the west. Not much was said on the way, an early June day sliding beneath us, the water singing, father upstream and me down, jumping, wading, fishing the channels. It was all we needed. He liked to fish upstream. I learned to fish downstream. <laughs> My brother liked to fish from a boat, so it was usually just the two of us when we were out fly fishing. We also lived on a small farm early on in my childhood, and this is uh, about that time. Industry. Crystal was about 45 when she started to make those crazy things. Lived across the pasture from us on a little hill. She'd always been good with a sewing machine, clothes for the kids, pillows, shawls, little cross cloth baskets, boss, little cloth boxes at Christmas. But then these strange, odd, peculiar things started to show up at the county fair. Dogs with alligator heads, snakes with human heads and belled tails, a turquoise starfish with a moon face, four lifelike kittens on a sofa cushion. A store owner uptown bought a few and put them, put them in the window. One of his drummers took a couple to a show in Denver. Three year, in three years' time, she had a half a dozen neighbors sewing for her in a converted barn. The following year, we saw her, her husband, Bob, and he had leased out his pasture and hay field we started to see him down at the river in a new boat. We'd anchor by him at the forks and shoot the breeze, the warm sun washing over us. It was an education in many ways. This is called the meal. Spirit made me flesh in this river walking land among the deer dance people singing the dreams alive. Flesh made me spirit in this dream of bone and water to slip this thin skin and walk between. The platter is, ha is passed from hand to hand, each tongue tasting the river in the salmon's flesh. I used to think I could tell which river of salmon and coming out had came from when I tasted it. I said I was at home in the water. This is about that. Waiting. When I'm thigh deep in the mood of water, when I'm thigh deep, the mood of water moves me like the wind moves and challenges a bird. It's no mean, it's no weak wandering. It carries the trial of mountains, the life and death of unnumbered creatures, fish and crawdads, snakes and snails, the wonderment of living things whispered in the mud and sand and in rock crevice and root. I'm in it, of it.
One of the first jobs I had after high school was working in a VA hospital, and I worked the swing shift. It was very handy because I could work uh, from three to well, three to midnight and fish in the mornings. Mm -hmm. This is 1965. In stream. It was a beautiful in between. The sky hanging bright from here to forever, where Don and I anchored the North Fork slapping its music against the hull. It was a long moment, a pause, a bubble in space-time. I was back from the cattle call induction center where a young doctor classified me as 1Y and sent me home. The Vietnam War raged over the horizon, having already taken classmates, and here I was cradled in the buoyance of this stream and the reprieve I knew to be vulnerable. But here in the golden eye of summer, isolated from the currents on shore, I fished with almost complete freedom. I worked at the VA hospital with veterans from World War I, World War II, and Korea. I knew the hunted, haunted, and broken, all the variations on disturbed brains, wards of men living a slow, dying, locked in rooms and hallways beyond any known help. We took care of their daily needs, kept them safe and fed. A few would arise from catatonic stillness and go home to the barrage of the world, then come back in a few months. In a year, I would join the Army National Guard. In two, I would be in Fort Lewis running the courses, ground smooth by thousands of other feet. Water slapped the fiberglass hull, nothing on the line but a spinner and the pull of the current. Monsters all. I'm fishing around little grass tufted islands, land a couple, keep one. When I haul in a 10 inch rainbow, Taking the hook out, I see a little head down its gullet. This greedy fish hadn't digested one meal before it went after the artificial bug I offered. Heron, egret, otter, and merganser, kingfisher trying to swallow a fish the size of its head, and me, a bunch of marauders on this dappled stream. I slid it open, feed the guts and half-swallowed fish to the crawdads. Up at the house, I fry it for lunch. <laughs> we had moved up to, uh, for you fly fishermen up there, we had moved up to just upstream from uh, Whistler's Bend. And uh, I could generally go down and catch my lunch anytime I wanted if I wasn't too greedy. This is called Last Time. He has emphysema and a bad heart valve the last time we fish the mountain water. He knows the valve can go at any time. Refuses replacement surgery, says he's had enough of that. I take the bridge to the other side and he slides down the near bank. Looking into the pool between us, I can see trout hanging in the current. I watch my father catch a fish before I get to where the rapids tail out. It's a big river with fish holding along the current's edge, behind rocks and under shadows, waiting for life to deliver what it will. It will be several years before an oxygen tank is necessary. And this communion with the river is a daydream. So we fish our separate sides of the same water. I catch a few small ones and throw them back. Two keepers in my creole when I head to our rendezvous. He makes it up the bank, stopping now and then to breathe 
and I see his four fine rainbows. He has bragging rights today. <laughs> I'm going to mention the cable crossing hole in this poem. There was a place, a very nice place along the river where a cable was across the river with a little gondola on it that somebody from the Forest Service or power company or somebody would get, in, get into that little gondola and go to the other side. Um, I, I don't think they were afraid of heights. <laughs> cable crossing. I stop at the cable crossing hole when light just touches the top of the canyon. I slip down the bank under the trees to liquid emerald and roll cast to rings of rising trout. They pay little attention to my muddler or mayfly. I set the fly rod down. This deep green world turns to magic at twilight and I give in. The fish jump and roll as I breathe the living air. I'll be here at 17 and 70, life washing through me this small infinity. Mm -hmm. That's from Daybreak on the Water. Now I'm going to read a few uh, from uh, Without a Map. Uh, I thought I'd read a few from uh, Inspired by the Sunset Mobile Park. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine some older single wides and a few double wides and maybe a new one up there toward the road. This poem is called Betty's Park. Snow at 3,000 feet, cold rain down here. Ray Lee Walker holed up in his trailer on a three-day drunk comes out for just as the sky opens and stars surrounding a bright moon like revelation and he commences to sing lovesick blues in the best downhearted twang. Lights come on in the day workers' places. Shouts and barks roll down the lane. But it's Betty Shambliss who helps him finish the fourth chorus and gets him back inside before someone takes a piece of flat iron to his head. Betty knows everybody's business, as if there were secrets anyway and thinks of the park as her family. It might, be, it might be an outgrowth of being a beautician or just growing up lonely and getting more so as an adult, living in the margins, three years sober. Lights come on, dogs turn around and go back to sleep. Betty puts on the coffee, gets an afghan she's been working and busies her hands. She thinks about her mother coming home 40 years ago, greasy from cooking midnight to breakfast at the Red Hat Cafe across from the mill. And a couple of trailers down, mobile homes, I mean to say, uh, this is road work. Tammy's divorces line up in her mind like a trail of wrecked cars. They'd been fixers mostly, trying to fix herself by working on someone worse off than her. The semi-pro football player, when she was 18, is still out there trying to make it big in real estate. She used to see him when her mother was still alive, his suit jacket thinner and shinier each time. And Jake, Jesus, fat Jake, he was all Santa Claus when they got together. But after the wedding bells, he had to keep track of her every minute of the damn day. Two years after she left, he fell over, a deep fried time bomb. And Willie, her slow-eyed mechanic with cracked and crusty hands, he, nodded off, he just nodded off 
He'd feed and sleep like a barnyard sheep. Still may not know she's gone. <laughs> Tammy looks out the trailer and looks out the trailer next door, her hands in warm dishwater. Maybe she'll start dancing again. And a couple of trailers down the lane again. This is t entitled, There's No One Left on the Moon. There's no one left on the moon. Couldn't grow a garden or play tennis, so they came home. <laughs> wanted, to mine, mo wanted to mine rocks like they did Kentucky, but it's a long ways to run rail cars. <laughs> Smitty trum trundles down the ramp with his walker, chugging a, like an old steam engine, heading to the mailboxes. Covers about three inches with every step, but he'll make it. They wanted to name the moon the 51st state after they planted the flag. Didn't even have to kill the people who lived there. They, they can try it sometime when we're more prosperous. Smitty nods as he goes by, keeping his eyes on his destination like a tightrope walker, not looking down. Maybe there's a pension check or a birthday card from his insurance agent. This is called Song. In the goose down air of spring, a song drifts up the row of trailers. A voice, pale and unprofessional, lingers like a scent on the porches under eaves, rises through cottonwood leaves. Neighbors have stopped talking, as if accepting a blessing of of, of the unsayable, the unknowable. After it stops, we hesitate, unwilling to let go of something we never held. Those were from uh, Without a Map. And now some from Easter Creek, uh, my newest book. It's from uh, Main Street Rag. And <clears throat> Easter Creek is a community, a small town that is upriver from a bigger town named McKinley. And uh, that's probably all you need to know. This is called Decking. Sweat rolls down, the, down my sides, the insides of my thighs. It's a money job. Building a deck around a pool I will never swim in, saying, yes, I'll do that, or where do you want this? I'll see you tomorrow. The gate clanks shut as I, the, the gate clanks shut. I know the code today, but I won't in a week. My dusty blue pickup snakes down Mountain View Drive by houses that drop in price as I descend. Green Mountain Lumber used to sit where a subdivision creeps down to the river. Three different styles, your choice. There's work in McKinley for us hammer jockeys. I follow Turner Road out of the Dunn Hills toward Easter Creek. Sunlight reflects from windows of the old Lathrop Creamery where we bought ice cream in brown paper tubs when summers were endless. I cross the river into the small crop of bungalows. Kids play hopscotch in the receding light. And words fill again along with soup pots, our four, four street lights popping on. Mm. Mm. This is called Ceremony. 
It was after the I do's or the I wills. I don't know which they said because I wasn't paying much attention. The singing and the saying, the admiration and praying, and I suppose the kissing, when I heard the motorcycle rumbling close, then up the three steps into the foyer, and there he was, gunning that engine, turned sideways, looking at Brenda and her about to melt. She looked around from her position as second bridesmaid for a split second before running down the aisle, taking off her high heels and giving her posy to Christmas, Crystal Shank's daughter, Crystal Shank, Luann's daughter, hitching up her peach collared dress and climbing on behind Lad Montgomery, AKA Lad the Bad. Hugging him good as they roared out and down the three steps, it took about two minutes before starting to think about food. <laughs> Lad and Brenda will show up in a few more poems in here. A small community has a certain intimacy that can be very good and also have its problems. This is a dialogue poem, and it's a poem, I call it a dialogue po poem because <coughs> most of it is dialogue. Uh, this is called 34. The Duck Inn is narrow, a row of tables, the bar, an ornate back bar with dozens of bottles <coughs> glinting in the long mirror. Gretchen sets a cup cupcake in front of trucks. Gretchen, happy birthday. Daryl, how old? Trucks. I'm older than Jesus. <laughs> Daryl, another deployment would have fixed that. <laughs> Trucks, I finally woke up. Dying for nothing is shit. Daryl, got that right. Trucks, two kids going to their games and school stuff. I had all the adrenaline I need for a while. Daryl, sometimes I want to yell and break things, you know? <coughs> I want to wake people up and tell them what's going on. Trucks, but you'd have to know what's going on. Daryl, I feel like I'm living in two dimensions, flat. I'd like to pull all the other dimensions into existence. Trucks, I change tires, I fix brakes, and go to the game on Friday night, drink beer with you. The only dimension I know is the one I got. Daryl, eat your cupcake. <laughs> We all carry our baggage, and this is a poem about that. It's called Jacket. I was born into a racist family in a racist town in a county that took its bigotry for granted. I was born into a loving family in a community of generous folks who gave me everything they could. These were the same places, the same people mostly. The racism lived in the mechanics, in the mechanisms of thought carried from place to place like great grandma's quilt. Yet these were the people I knew to be kind and willing to help. They lived quiet lives, hoping to have enough in the bank to bury them when the time came. Racism was woven into the fabric like a smoldering thread. To dismiss or deny is to hand down the garment from generation to generation like some immutable heritage. It puts a straitjacket on everyone. I find it in the closet when I'm looking for my boots. I swear I've burned it a dozen times. There is a, 
a make-do sort of attitude in Easter Creek. You figure out what you want to do and you figure out how to do it. This is called Thursday Ritual. Brad backs the pickup across the yard in line with the top step and lays down two by twelves to bridge the gap. His father watches from the window. This is a Thursday ritual going to town. His father gets the door opened and navigates the electric, chair, electric wheelchair to the end of the boards. Far enough, Brad hollers after the near disaster of the first time when his father tried to run it on his own. Brad shifts the chair into its lowest setting and moves it across, centering it in the bed. He ties it off with rope to the four corners tight. Brad doesn't go over 40, but the old man loves the rush. There's still some rascal in him, and Brad guesses some beagle. A rain poncho helps sometimes, but snow is out. His father traverses Fairhaven Market, Malin's Hardware, and Brandy's Cafe, saying hello and telling the same joke at each place. The loading dock at the back of the library is, is the launching pad for home. Houses pass, trees and pasture, a new truck at, by Harmon's Barn, old fields, a bustle of town, and the ride. Many of the people in uh, Easter Creek are composites and uh, fictional characters. This one is more close to home. This is, uh, I'm a product of the West, and this is uh, partly my heritage. It's called Trail. Mama would get these legal looking papers that told her she could have a little bitty piece of an oil well if she signed them. She stuffed them in the wood stove, shysters, she'd say. Her mother came to Idaho in a dusty wagon as a girl, leaving Oklahoma with scraps of a, of a life hard won, breed mother and a treadle sewing machine. They survived in, the crease of, in a crease of sagebrush hills. Those orphan, those orphan Osage genes washed thin among the Scots, Irish, German, Danish, and English echo down a trail of war and migration, the dispossessed drifting like dandelion seed. Their offspring got to Oregon, and here I am. She met this mill worker over by Baker and they decided to keep house together. <laughs> I have several poems in here uh, about people aging and the golden years. This is called The Golden Years. <laughs> My knees are shot, two surgeries, can't dance or walk very far. Spine is kinked. One surgery, another one down the road if I can't avoid it. Chiropractor made it worse. Cortisone epidural got most of the pain. Left leg is half numb. There's a Taylor's bunion on my right foot the size of a small pecan. Need a wide shoe. What's this about peripheral neuropathy? Losing feeling. Is this like someone in the cold drawing into the core? Lost four of my grinding teeth. They put a scope up in my bladder a few months ago. I'd rather not do that again. Blood pressure, pretty good. Anti, the anti-inflammatory pill doesn't make me dizzy most of the time. My brain tells me to watch the, as it fizzles and sparks. The older I get, more people think I, I need to buy their crap. 
a cemetery plot, hearing aids, insurance for my insurance, fake social security notices, wanting my wrinkled dollars, computer help from some call center, who knows where. I hope they get a real job someday. Can't garden as much as I used to. I do have someone that loves me. And when the sun's on the porch, the junk goes to visit. <laughs> There's two eateries in Easter Creek, and I already, already mentioned one, the Brandy's Cafe. Well, I'm going to mention the other one, Lou's Chinese and American Cuisine. This, and the poem is called Dan. Disheveled, soiled, stinking, he paces Second Street around the closed foundry counts the splotches, avoids the curb for 26 steps, slumping shoulders, the world in his head turning, his mind connected to, fi to the fibers that speak from beyond, whirring, hear the hum? You don't know and will never know what he knows. Lou of Lou's Chinese and American cuisine puts a small white box with likely leftovers behind the dumpster, with a plastic fork stuck in the handle, where if it's eaten or not, can easily be tossed. Lou watches sometimes. Dan will pick up the box, smell it, put it down, walk around the block, come back, pick it up, and sometimes he eats. The last of the dishes roll out of the washer Dan turns around three times, testing the fibers for true south. Um, two more? Two more. Great. Okay. This is called Trust. I knew a blind man a few years ago. I was one of the people who he relied on to take him to the doctor across town or to drive through the ham drive to the drive through for a hamburger. One day he asked me to help him taste the sea. There was a wide flat beach up from the north jetty and I took him there. We trekked over the barrier dune to the water's great voice. He took off his shoes, rolled up his pants, and listened to my direction. The flat scallops of surf, of surf washed, washed toward us. Then around his feet, he waded to shin deep, cupped his hands, and scooped up the sandy brine. He hollered with joy and leaped around. It was a good day for sand. <laughs> I don't know whether you've ever uh, had the notion to taste the surf, but it is pretty gritty. <laughs> I'll finish with the uh, last poem in the book, Solstice. It's one of those warm evenings in the new summer when possibility circulates in the air like an invitation. Even the bones that can't dance want to. I have entered mountain water as it creates the valley, it follows otter and oozel, my companions, swimming the reflection of night. I have been one with the song that sings itself into being. The pattern of the dance found me, minnow and starlight. There's an ache for those distant dances, weighted rivers, and Brahms on the car radio, all the windows down, and no one caring whether I dance or yodel. Freedom can speak on soft air, and when you hear its voice, run like the devil to catch up, it doesn't stay around long. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. And
We've had applause here from the studio audience, and we're virtual. Yes. But the other thing that I would like you to do is hear from all those watching loud, sustained applause. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. Yes. yes. Thank you so much for the, for the reading. So many things that struck me. For example, the river running me alive. Uh, dogs with alligator heads. <laughs> Each tongue tasting the river. Cradling the buoyancy of this stream. This communion with the river in a daydream. Hope I've got that right. Like a trail of wrecked cars. <laughs> and one I, uh, one I especially love, I started a deep fried time bomb. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so many things that, that were uh, memorable from that. So what we're going to do is ha have a uh, question and answer period. And then uh, Gary is going to end that with a, a poem, a final poem. And I know we have one thing here from the chat. Carlos, Carlos Reyes says, uh, hi, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> so hi, Gary. Hi. <laughs> uh, I've got a question for you, which is, uh, who are you reading now? When you read poetry, who are you reading? Well, I read uh, quite a few different things. Um, I uh, actually, right at this moment, uh, I'm reading uh, Just Mercy, the, the book um, that is um, by a, a lawyer who worked in the South. And it's not, it's, it's a prose. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, I would say, a must read because it's about how. Uh, how we, how much we, ha how far we have to go, in terms of, um, of making a, a better place for all of us. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just mercy. It's a great book. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. What did I finish? Um, I've I finished a, a book by Jess Walter, hmm. uh, a novel. Um, that's what was that one? Uh, it was a book about labor history up in Spokane, mm -hmm. uh, but he's a, he turns a fine phrase. He's really good, oh. uh, uh, you know. And along with uh, people, uh, I don't know that, like uh, all the light we cannot see. If you've read that, that's has wonderful language work in it. Mm -hmm. um, and I I pick up poetry all the time, and we have some, I think, really. Fine Oregon poets. The, um, mm. I just got um, Kim Stafford's new book, mm. um, and uh, the the example of people that have been near me or around me, and um, Clem Stark, uh, uh, Lex Runciman, uh, Eric Muller, mm. just n numerous people. Um, Paul Ann Peterson, uh, our our poet laureates that have been. Uh -huh. Working with us and working with kids and whoever, uh, and with poetry, I think it's just marvelous. Yeah. Well, here's a related question: uh, Who would you say has influenced you? Uh, early on, uh, it was people like Denise Levertov and Gregory Corso, um, people who were, I think, um, taught me to be brave, taught me to go ahead and put. And, and let it fall on the page, let it get down there in the, in the paper, and, and uh, I didn't have to show it to anybody, but, but to, you know, let mm -hmm. your mind go and see what happens. And uh -huh. um, in, for, in terms of language, uh, I, you know, William Stafford, uh, um, James Wright, Richard Wright, actually, too, James Baldwin. But people like Faulkner and Cormac McCarthy, I come back to mm -hmm. over and over again. Um, someday I'll probably read all of Faulkner, but I haven't got there yet. Uh. <laughs> but his, his, he can prattle along, and then, and then you have a, a section that is just stunning. Uh -huh. And I wait for those uh -huh. moments, uh -huh. you know, just how they use language. And, and speaking of, of bravery, they they, uh, they'll go anywhere, do anything. And sometimes it's published, you know? Uh -huh. It makes you wonder what didn't get published. Uh -huh. But uh, 
Um, Joe Wilkins and, and uh, Henry Hughes also have some very nice language work, I think. Well, thank you. Here's a couple of things off the chat. Carolyn Martin says, the ringing, the river singing me alive. Lovely, Gary. Ah, thank you. Uh, Alice Hardesty says, hi, Gary. Enjoyed your poetry so much. Maybe you remember that we sat next to each other at the Ashland Book Fair about <laughs> three years ago. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Here's one from Kevin Colhane. Gary, when did you start writing poetry and did anyone encourage you when you were young? Um, I think encouragement helps a lot. Um, but I, I'm, I'm dyslexic and I was, uh, I was not a very good reader when I was young, but the language was very alive in me. And uh, my mother read to the family aloud. This was before we had television. And so we'd be there in the evening, listen to my mother read. Uh, I remember the Ralph Moody books. Uh, they're about ranch life, and, mm -hmm. which is her life. And she would read those aloud to us. And, and then uh, later on in high school, I, I started writing. And um, my uh, freshman English teacher, I, I was supposed to write an essay, and I ended up writing a short story. And uh, he thought it was OK. <laughs> OK. <laughs> you know, yeah. I had permission, essentially. And then later on, um, I suppose junior year, I started writing poetry. and. Um, and you've been doing it ever since. Yeah, yeah. And I found out that that uh, it was fun to do in college, not for a class, but just uh, a friend of mine and I would write things and, and go over and, um, and and read to the women's dorms. And sometimes they liked it. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yeah. Good. Encouragement can come from any direction, you know. Yeah, it's really important. <laughs> Yeah, the, the high school was very good because uh, it seemed like they were really in my corner. Yeah, mm. yeah. Well, I'm going to check and see if there's anyone in the uh, studio audience that, that has a question. And Bill does. Yeah, Gary, I um, really appreciate the, um, your early fishing poems right? uh, because I had the same kinds of experience only in Idaho, on the north, northern Idaho, Clearwater River, yeah. Boxall River, and those. And my father and I spending hours. Mm -hmm. But eventually, uh, we came to a point where there were almost too many people. Yeah. Who had, my father used to say, you have to bring your own rock. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. I was wondering, did, did you ever get to that stage of writing about that particular well, I've, I've certainly been there, that, and uh, it's, it's discouraging, you know, um, especially when you've had the, the, the experience of being on the river, with the river, and nothing else before that. I mean, there wasn't any rafter coming through, you know, or, or, uh, or you know, you didn't have to kick the beer bottle out of the way, or, you know, I mean... Uh, and I was lucky on the Umpqua that we had a section of river that was fly fishing only. And so you didn't have the detritus of, of, the, of the worm can or the, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and, I'm, and I have fished in many different ways. I'm not denigrating worm fishermen, but because uh, I've caught steelhead on worms and it worked just fine. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it's, it does seem to be about the, the amount of population that discovered it, and there's a, a minority who don't respect it, and they can mess it up. Um, but yeah, hmm. how, do we, how do we have what we want and be there too? Yeah. I'm like moving, moving from cooking what you catch to catch and release. Yeah. Hmm. Big transition. It is a big transition. Yeah. I think Connie's got a question. Yeah, I was wondering about your practice of writing. If you have a certain time and place you'd like to write, and how do you start a new poem? Uh, I try not to think about it too much. 
and uh, let it happen. I, I do try to reserve time in the morning so that space is open. And uh, there's, there are some writers that, are, that I read that turn on the language for me. And it's sort of easier to kind of let something happen in your mind. You catch a phrase, a few words, a sound, an image, a memory, and, and you go ahead and start with a couple of words and see where it goes. Um, I think William Stafford called that smokes away and it, you, you just follow wherever the smoke goes. Um, it's, but it, it's sound and sense, you know. Uh, syllables and sinews. It's, it's, you, you, you just follow those words and see where it goes. Hmm. I almost answered your question. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Let's take two more questions. And then uh, Gary has a poem that he's going to end with. So I'll, I'll see if Jane. Actually, can. you've answered my question of how you, how you started. I, but I'm curious, do you handwrite your, your, poem, your work? Or do you type it out, or do you do a bit of both? I, I do a bit of both, but, it, but it's primarily on the computer. Mm. Uh, I, it took me a while to retrain my brain. Now it's trained, mm. so I go to the keyboard. Mm. You know, but, but I often will put, uh, I have little pieces of paper all over the place with, with phrases or ideas or whatever. Mm. And uh, you know, one of them will bear fruit sometimes. Mm. Okay. Is there, I have a question, and I wanted to ask you about your book, Ordinary Gravity. Yes, and from Early Writing Press. Man. Yeah. Hmm? From Early Press. Yes. yes. So you divided that into four, into five sections. Yeah. So how did that come about, and what was the, the hardest thing that you encountered in, uh, with that book? Uh, I had to... Um, Think about it. I, I began with um, with about three sections, three of those pieces together, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and um, and then I started thinking about them kind of chronologically, and how they fit either my life or a, a certain timescape, and if if they were kind of clustered in that <clears throat> period, then I started to draw those lines and see. You know, I didn't know whether it'd be two peop two clusters, you know, mm -hmm. or three, or so. It, I just tried to find the breaks that kind of made sense to me, mm -hmm. um, and hopefully the clusters had some sort of sense on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and often, in that book, the some of the some of the toughest poems are in the middle. So I kind of start, not, you know kind of soft and in with something sort of positive, huh. but you have to go through the eye of this needle to get there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now the toughest poems are in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for talking about that. You can uh, take a look at Gary's website for some information about his books. Uh, I'm also going to send out a email with the broadside poem, and we can put whatever information in that as well about connecting with him and getting his books. Gary's going to end the reading with a, uh, a final poem. All right. I'm going to end with a small poem from Daybreak on the Water. Stone. Like water runs around the rounding stone, time swims around the smoothing self that polished becomes nothing but shine. Mm. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Gary, for being here. That was terrific. Maggie Chula is going to be here in May. We appreciate uh, Kevin.
Carey being here. This is Tom Hogan. Good night, everybody, from the Milwaukee Poetry Series.